Karen and I are glad to be back with you once again this morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 14, 736 in the Pew Bible. That's the page number. John 14. I'm going to skip around a little bit in the reading, beginning at verse 15 of John 14. These are the words of Jesus, our Lord, on the night before his crucifixion as he was teaching his disciples. John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Down to verse 21. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the father who sent me. Drop down to chapter 15, verse 9. As the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 12, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore, Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends. Because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Let's pray, please. Father, we're so grateful for this word of our Lord Jesus. We pray that you will speak to our hearts here this morning. We pray that our love for you, our love for one another will grow. And Lord, I personally want to join with the prayers of this body of Christ and ask that you will guide them in the meeting that will follow this service. Lead them according to your goodwill, Lord. Give them unity in deciding their future pastoral leadership, we pray. And now, Lord, do again speak to us through your word. And may we be willing to hear and obey all that you say to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Do you love me? This was the question that our Lord Jesus asked Peter on one of the days after his resurrection as he was meeting with several of his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And just after breakfast, he asked Peter, Do you love me? And that's the question I want us all to think about together here this morning. Do you love Jesus Christ? Now, Jesus asked this question of Peter three times, probably corresponding to the three denials that uh, Peter had voiced the night before the crucifixion of Jesus. He denied his Lord, three times. So now Jesus asks him three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus commanded him, feed my lambs. Again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, said Jesus. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, said the Lord Jesus to Peter. 
So three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times Jesus, uh, Peter professed his love for Christ. And three times Jesus said essentially, well, show me. Show me that you love me by taking care of my sheep, taking care of my people. So that's our subject this morning. Do we love Jesus Christ? This comes up repeatedly in the upper room discourse in John 14 and 15 that we've been considering together on Sunday mornings, the Sunday mornings I've been with you over these last several months. In this last discourse that Jesus gives to his disciples the night before his crucifixion, he keeps circling back to different subjects over and over again. He talks about the Holy Spirit. We looked at that. He talks about prayer. We've looked at that. This morning, we're looking at our love for Christ, particularly how we show our love for Christ. How do we show our love for Jesus Christ? How can you demonstrate your love for Christ? Jesus gives us six answers to that question in these verses. Six answers to the question, how we can show our love for Christ. Here's the first answer. We show our love for Christ by obeying his commands. That's in chapter 14, verse 15. He said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Now, that's a conditional statement. It's one of those if-then statements. If you love me, then in consequence, as a result, as an evidence of that love, you will keep my commands. Love will be expressed. It will be demonstrated by obedience. Now, that word keep there could be translated observe. You will observe my commands. You will fulfill my commands. You will obey my commands. The you in that verse, if you love me, you will keep my commands. The you is in the plural. He's talking to all the disciples. All 11 of them were in the upper room at that point. Judas Iscariot had left. So this morning... He's addressing all the members of Perryville Bible Church, all of us. A church that loves Jesus will be marked by obedience to his commands. That's how we can show and demonstrate that we truly love Christ, by our obedience. Now, in our culture, love is thought of largely in emotional terms. That's just the way it is. I think it's uh, Hollywood has sort of won us over. How do I feel about someone? That's where we picture love happening in our feelings. And no doubt there is an emotional element to love. Verbal expression of love is also important. To say the words, I love you. My wife loves to hear me say, I love you, dear. I love you. We say it every day to each other. But here, Jesus says, love is expressed through action, through obedience to his commands. In this case, as we say, actions speak louder than words. If we truly love the Lord, then we will obey him. So that's the first answer to the question, how we demonstrate our love for Christ It's by obeying his commands. But remember, I said there are six answers to that question here in this passage. So here's the second answer. You show your love for Christ by obeying his commands. Here it is again in verse 21. The one who has my commands, said Jesus, and keeps them is the one who loves me. Now, I changed the way I expressed it a little bit from we to you, and that's because Jesus changes the way he he says it. First, he expressed it in the plural, but now it's in the singular. The one 
who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. So this comes down to each individual heart, each individual will, so to speak. Do you love Jesus? Are you keeping his commands? Notice it's the one who possesses them, who has my commands, who's aware of them, who knows them, but also keeps them. That is the one who loves Jesus, who shows that he or she loves Jesus. You see, as James says in chapter 1 of his letter, it's not the hearers of the word only who are blessed by God, but the doers. So we have the Lord's commands, but are we obeying the Lord's commands? Now, in this case, in verse 21, he attaches a promise. He says, and the one who loves me, and remember, the one who loves him will keep his commands, and the one who loves him, or who loves me, will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Now, that is a wonderful promise, my friends. If we love Jesus, which we show by keeping his commands, the Father will love me, and Jesus himself will love me and will reveal himself to me. Now, wait a minute. That sounds like we earn God's love by loving him first. But no, that's not the way it works. We love him because he first loved us. Remember that verse? 1 John 4, 19. God first showed his love for us. We sang about that this morning. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. God revealed himself to the world through his son, Christ. Christ died for us. When we put our faith in Jesus, he forgives our sins. He gives us a new life, and we become God's children. Now, when he, when he took the initiative to love us, the Bible says, we were sinners, we were God's enemies, we were ungodly. That's all in Romans 5. But still, God loved us and gave his son to die for us. And once we believe in Jesus, we're now counted as God's children, his sons and his daughters. We actually become friends of Jesus. And when we put our faith in Christ, our faith expresses itself in love. Love expresses itself by obedience to his commands. And as we obey God's commands, the, the commands of Christ here, then God just showers more love upon us. You see, it's like this sort of repeating cycle. God loves us first. We respond by faith and love back to him. He responds back with more love for us. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, says Jesus. I also will love him and we will reveal myself to him. So do you want to grow in a deep love relationship with Jesus Christ? where this love is back and forth. He loves you, you love him back. He loves you back. Do you want to know Christ more fully? He says here, I will also love him and will reveal myself to him. My friends, it's, it's just a plain fact that those who live in obedience to Christ's commands they are the ones who grow ever deeper in love with Jesus and have a more intimate relationship with him. And obedience is a key factor in that relationship. Well, let's look at answer number three. 
How do we show our love for Christ? You show your love for Christ by obeying his word. It's sounding a lot like answer number two and answer number one. Look at verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot. You see, there were two of the 12 disciples who had the name Judas. And so John wants us to know this Judas was not Iscariot. Uh, this Judas is only mentioned in the apostolic lists in the other Gospels, but he also comes up here one time in the Gospel of John, and he asks Jesus a question. Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Probably in Judas's mind, when the Messiah reveals himself with power and glory, everybody's going to see him. And, and uh, he'll, he'll, he'll reveal himself to, to, to the whole world. That's the idea, apparently, that's in Judas's mind. But Jesus is making a distinction in the way that he will reveal himself to those who belong to him. And he just comes back with his answer by basically saying the same thing all over again. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Here again, it's a conditional sentence. If then, it's individualized, personalized. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Instead of saying keep my commands, here he says keep my word. Essentially, I think he's saying the same thing, although perhaps the word here is a broader expression. He will, he will follow my teachings in total. And then he makes another promise. My father will love him. He said that back in verse 21. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that an incredible promise? Can you imagine God the Father and God the Son coming and living with you? That's what he promises. He makes that promise to those who love Jesus and keep his word, and keep his word. Again, I don't think it's a matter of merit. We don't earn God's presence in our lives through our obedience. The promise here is given to those who have already responded to God's love by faith and who follow up that faith with obedience. That obedience is an expression of our love for Christ and that obedient love is reciprocated by God and he comes to dwell with us in a very personal way. Usually we think of the one dwelling with us and in us as the Holy Spirit. And that, in fact, is what Jesus said earlier in the chapter in John 14, 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So believers have the Holy Spirit with us and in us. But in verse 23, he says, we, the Father and the Son, also make our home with the one who loves Jesus Christ, which is an amazing, amazing promise. The fourth answer that Jesus gives you show your lack of love for Christ by not obeying his word. He now says it in the negative. Verse 24. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. Jesus is passing along the word of his Father in all that he taught and said and commanded and if we don't love Jesus, we will not keep his word. Notice again, it's individual. It's talking about the individual person who lives in disobedience. Now, friends, when we talk about obeying his commands, we're not talking about perfect obedience because there is no one who can keep the commands 
of Jesus perfectly. But we're talking, I believe, about the overall direction of a person's life. Is this person pointed in the direction of obedience to God or disobedience to God? Is this person resisting the commands of the Lord? And it comes down, do you or I know of an area in your life where you are resisting the voice of the Holy Spirit? something that God has pointed out to you, maybe even repeatedly. But you keep going like this. Keep going like this. That's actually rebellion. Rebellion. My father-in-law used to say there are two kinds of rebellion. There's this kind of rebellion, you know, holding your fist out at, uh, toward God. And uh, that's kind of like active rebellion. This is like passive rebellion. No, 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 Lord. Another time, another time but they both amount to disobedience to God. And to the extent that I am unwilling to obey, I'm demonstrating my lack of love for Jesus Christ. That's what he says. Answer number five. You know, when early on, when you heard me say there were six answers, you thought, boy, this is going to be a long sermon. He's got six points to make. Turns out there's just one point. We remain in Christ's love by obeying his commands. There it is again. I'm over to chapter 15 now. Following his allegory about the vine and the branches, which I spoke on a previous Sunday, Jesus then says in John 15, 9, As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Now, in the, in the parable or the allegory of the vine and the branches, Jesus talked about remaining in union with the vine. Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, and the way to remain united to Christ is by, by abiding in Christ, remaining in union with him. He drops all that metaphorical language here, and he, sa he talks about instead of remaining in the vine, he says, remain in my love. Rest in my love. Continue in my love. Talking about his love for us. And how do we continue in his love for us? By keeping his commands. You will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus wants us to be like him. He remained in his Father's love by obedience to his Father. We continue in Christ's love for us by obedience to his commands. Picture a home with loving parents. In this home. So this is a home, an earthly home, just pervaded by love for the children. And picture the children reciprocating that love by loving their parents and showing their love by obedience to their parents. Boy, that, boy that's a happy home. <laughs> Parents loving their kids, making sacrifices for their children, and the children reciprocating by, by loving their parents and obeying their parents. They remain in the home of love, in the home pervaded by the love of their parents. It's the same way with God. He loves us. Jesus loves us. We remain in that environment of his love by obeying his commands and showing our love for him. What specific commands are we talking about? Well, Jesus gave many commands. Read the Sermon on the Mount, for example. Many commands there of Christ. And the Sermon on the Mount is really his commentary to a large extent 
on the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Notice Romans 13, 8 through 10. Paul says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. See, there's, there's, no, there's no conflict between God's commandments and, and love. No, love is a fulfillment of of those commandments. If I really love my neighbor, I won't steal his wife. If I really love my neighbor, I won't steal his property. I won't ruin his reputation. According to the the 10th commandment, I won't even desire his harm. I won't envy him. I won't covet. All those are expressions of love. Obeying those commandments. But interestingly enough, here Jesus boils it all down to one commandment in verse 12. This is my command, love one another as I have loved you. That's kind of a summary of the, of the horizontal commands for our neighbors. But now he sort of uh, deepens the expression of that by that phrase, as I have loved you. Jesus, of course, loved us by laying his life down for us, sacrificial love. And he says in verse 13, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. We'll come to that in a moment. So yes, Jesus showed his love by sacrifice, We're to show our love for one another by sacrifice. In 1 John, this is uh, one of the letters of John, so by the same author as the fourth gospel, he tells us, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. There it is again. It's not just a matter of words or feelings. It's a matter of action. In 1 John, it's a matter of seeing someone in need, in material need, and coming to help them, coming to their aid. Uh, sacrificing our, our, uh, our personal possessions so that their needs are being met. That's a way of expressing love. Notice again, the sixth and last answer to the question, how do we show our love for Christ? We show we are Christ's friends by doing what he commands. That's the sixth time in this passage that Jesus tells his disciples to obey his commands. Do you think he's making a point? The word friends in the original Greek language is actually a form of the word love in Greek. For those of you who might know a little bit here, phileo is one of the words for love, and it's used here in the Gospel of John. Philos is a friend. It's a form of the same word. Friendship involves love. We show that we are Christ's friends by doing what he commands. And notice, he says in verse 15, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Friends confide in one another. And Jesus says, I'm confiding in you. I'm telling you everything that I've heard from my father. That's the kind of relationship 
I have with you. That's what he said earlier. If you obey my commands, the Father will love you. I'll love you. I'll reveal myself to you. My Father and myself will come and make our home with you. Talk about friendship. Sounds like a family. Back to my earlier illustration. Picture this home. And let's just focus for a moment on the father and a son in this home. The father loves his son. The son reciprocates by obeying his father as an expression of his love back. As the son grows older, he consistently obeys his dad. And you know what develops as a result? A relationship of trust, of trust. If a child continually disobeys their parents, that, that corrodes any trust that might be there. But if a child obeys a loving parent and shows his love to, to his dad, then there's a growing trust relationship between them. And as the son grows older, the father will give more responsibility, more trust to his son. He'll even begin to confide in him, perhaps, as the son becomes an adult. And, and at last, the son's out of the home, and he's on his own. And in a really good relationship, the father and the son will actually form a friendship with each other. They'll become friends. Yes, they're always father and son. And Jesus, my, my friends, he's always our Lord. But he wants to have us as his friends as well. And that comes about by obedience to his commands. Are you one of Christ's friends? Do you love him? Do you obey his commands? Especially his command to love one another? Now, everything I've said here this morning is impossible in our own strength, but we have the Holy Spirit. That was about five sermons ago. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. He's with us to strengthen us, to enable us to keep his commands. Let's bow in prayer, please. Father, we thank you again this morning from the bottom of our hearts for your love for us. Thank you that you loved us. You demonstrated your love for us while we were yet sinners when Christ died for us. Thank you that you have made us now a part of your family. We are your sons and daughters, friends of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to display our friendship by obedience to his commands. And Lord, we ask for a new filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we will joyfully and willingly obey his commands. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.